I'd like to tell you a little bit about our most recent work where we've created a recrystallization app. So I'll show you how it works, and then I'll tell you about the gears behind the scenes, exactly what's being done to recommend a solvent for recrystallization. So I think most chemists would agree is that if you know that there's a good solvent to recrystallize a solid compound, you would do that uh, instead of chromatography. Certainly it scales much more easily uh, and cheaply, but the problem is, and I'm sure that you've all found this if you've worked in the lab, you have no guarantee of success. You could spend many, many days trying all kinds of different solvents and never really get something that's useful. So the problem with this is that there's not a rational way to do it. So what we thought we would do is to actually create an app that would reason out what it is, what information it needs, and then figure it out. So the app is available, xtlapp.wikis.com. It should run on most mobile devices, laptops, whatever. It was built basically for a mobile interface. And there's a bunch of things here, but if you hit the recrystallization solvent, it will default to this. So we tried to make it as convenient as possible. The identifier, you can use a common name. You can use a SMILES, ChemSpider ID, NGK. It's pretty flexible with the input. It'll default minimum boiling 60, maximum boiling 80. That can be changed to 100 or, or anything that you want. Obviously, you want a low boiling solvent so that the, your solid dries as easily as possible. And, of course, minimum percent yield is set at 80, but if you're not getting any hits, you can lower that. This is something I didn't fully appreciate when we started this project. The minimum concentration at boiling is actually really important. If you don't have a high solubility at the boiling point of the solvent, it, first of all, it wastes a lot of solvent, right, because you have to keep adding it, and it takes a really long time for the crystals to come out. And it's actually kind of hard to tell even if all of your solid has been dissolved. So that's why we set up this parameter work so far, but it can be changed. The endpoint temperature as well, you could set it to zero if you want to put it in an ice bath, but it defaults to 25. And if you run it for benzoic acid, you get four hits. This is from a collection of about 90 solvents, where we actually have descriptors for. And uh, if you look at the literature, it's a lot of stuff about water. So it's good that this comes up. But one, big, one surprise was carbon tetrachloride. Actually, it turns out to be a really good solvent to recrystallize benzoic acid that we hadn't come across in the literature. So that's the whole point is to get ideas. And if you click on any of these solvents, it will show you a temperature solubility curve, and you can see you know, what would happen if you were to go down to zero or any other temperature. And there's a, there was a bunch of links there. You can do the same thing with melting points. You can do, we have log P, even MSDS sheets. So that can be handy. So how does it work? So this is very short presentation of just the, 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 the concept of it. First, look up the, the bulk we have a solvent. That's easy. That's already been done. Second, look up the room temperature solubility, which we have a pretty large collection now, but we don't have everything. And so we had to come up with a, a model that worked well enough for this purpose. And I think that we have a pretty good model for neutral organics. This won't work with salts. So you look up the, the room temperature solubility and predict it. Then look up the melting points. And again, we have a pretty large collection, about 27,000 open melting points. But if we don't have it, we have a pretty good model that will predict it. When you put all these things together, you, you can actually have a pretty good guess of the solubility at the boiling point of the solvent. And then, of course, you can calculate the recrystallization yield. So that's how it works behind the scenes. Now, one of the things in my lab is that everything that we do is, is open. And I kind of want to share a little bit why we feel that that's actually an, an advantage. So the recrystallization app, first of all, is free and open, which means that it can be repurposed by anyone for any purpose, even commercial. And that's something in the open science community that's debated, but I think there's a consensus coming that actually don't try to restrict the non-commercial because people will not end up using it, you know, the people you want to use it. So I won't talk about it in detail, not much time, but we have an open solubility collection and an open model for solubility. So we're talking not just aqueous, but uh, a large range of solvents. We have uh, open melting point collection and a model as well. And uh, these depend mainly on the CDK, which is an open source software that actually has open descriptors. This is actually kind of challenging because most uh, software like this is commercial and then it becomes difficult to reuse the data. And then the experiments that are done in my lab, um, they're under open notebook science, which I'll show a little bit. 
So why be open? I'll tell you a story about something that happened very recently. So we're making these dibenzyl acetone derivatives, and uh, our collaborator, Andrew Lang, tried to dock them against tubulin, so that's the taxol binding site. And, you know, we just did a, a small test run, and we found that this top compound, the diphenanthrene compound, had the, the highest score. In fact, all the highest ones had, you know, these uh, planar polyaromatic uh, components. The number 10 was actually the naphthalene derivative. So, okay, we know this, right? We, we don't want to waste time with doing experiments to try to figure things out. Well, the top compound hasn't been published, but the second one has. So, great. We go in, we're going to try to replicate this. Well, this is what happens when you actually try to do that. So we know from our modeling and, and whatnot that that compound is going to be really insoluble. It's going to be hard to find a, a solvent that's compatible with this reaction and that actually will solubilize it. And so when you look at this paper, for example, it says uh, sodium hydroxide in an unknown amount of ethanol. Now, if you've ever tried to dissolve 30 grams of sodium hydroxide in ethanol, it can, you know, it can be a pretty large volume, right? So we don't actually know the amount of, of uh, solvent of uh, Solve the use here. And there's no NMR, there's no yield. So, you know, obviously they did it, so it exists somewhere. It's just it's not accessible to us. Another paper reports making the compound, but just says we did it like this organic synthesis paper, which sounds good until you realize that the compound they made is not in that organic synthesis. It's the benzaldehyde derivative, not the naphthal derivative. So what do we do, right? So we have to we have to start from somewhere. So what we do in our lab is we have this reaction attempts database. So all of our lab notebooks, when a student does an experiment, there's a lab notebook page, and that gets indexed in a machine-readable way in this database. And it turns out about 90% of these index reactions are what you might call failed. They're not successful. They don't lead to a, a, a product that was isolated and characterized. It could be a lot of failures. And our point is that there's a lot of value in that 90%. Okay, so I'll show you a couple of examples. Because it's machine readable, I could search, for example, give me all of the reactions with acetone that was an aldol colonization. And if you run that query, you will get a couple of hits. These are just a few. So this is an experiment by uh, Matthew McBride, who's working in my lab now. And uh, he, this is an unsuccessful experiment and normally would never be shared. But if you look at it, it's actually valuable information. Now, he followed a description of this reaction that used one to six ethanol water. That's probably a typo, because when you try to do this reaction, and you look at the log, uh, you're saying the solution was observed to separate into two layers. So the benzaldehyde could not dissolve in that ratio of water and ethanol. That's useful to know. All right, and we look at a successful one when you did a one to one, he got a very high yield and everything went fine. And the phenanthrene compound, he also successfully did, but it required a lot of experimentation. I can't, I don't have time to go through all the things, but it required changing the solvent to methanol, diluting by one order of magnitude, adding 81 equivalents of sodium hydroxide, and leaving it for three days. And the whole reason for that is because of solubility problems. And so, you know, this is a, all, all the data points leading to that, I think, are for what he's looking. So just a couple of examples of, of the, the ways that we use this open information. We have a template here. It's a Google spreadsheet. Anyone can go in, make a copy, and then you can play with it. And you would, if you're planning a reaction, you would just type acetone, and most of these fields would actually fill up by services that are run from within the Google spreadsheet. Just one example here. Let's say that you want a melting point. So you're in this Google spreadsheet, you hit the drop down. Hit get MP, and then the melting point will appear inside of the Google spreadsheet. So you can do that for density, molecular weight, any of the properties that a chemist might need. Uh, and then if you click on the link that's to the right of this, it will take you to all the numbers that were averaged to determine that number. So in this particular case, you know, you can be very confident that the value is very close to minus 114, and the, the two outliers in red were not included in the averaging. However, if you had clicked it and there was only one value, then you might think, I don't know how confident I am in that value. So that's why we show all of these sources. You can even put uh, access to NMRs. So if you're planning your reaction, all your starting materials, one click away from an interactive NMR, 
and that's very easy to do. If any of you are interested in that, we can do that from our machine. The advantage here is you don't have to keep printing out expansions. You can interactively zoom in and out with a mouse, get your coupling constants, look at impurities. That's all done directly from the Google spreadsheet. If you're interested in any of these, uh, the ONS web services .wikispaces.com. You'll find all of the services there and the template. And it's also an exhaustive list of all of the different functions that we've programmed into the Google spreadsheet with allowable input and outputs. So where are we going forward with this? So basically, we're, we're, we're trying to execute on this open chemical property matrix. So what we've done for melting point and solubility, we want to expand it to all of the properties that relate to organic chemical compounds. And if you read a paper where someone's built a model and something, what you'll find in the dark literature is relationships like this. So you can find a paper where, for example, they relate the flash point to the boiling point, or they relate the log P, the solubility, and the melting point. Okay, so what we're doing, we're taking all the open data that we have, and we're going to find out which one of these equations works well in a given part of the chemical space. So some of these might work very well for carboxylic acids, but they will fail for alcohols. The problem is the, the researcher who published it didn't have time to evaluate all possible organic compounds. And now we can as we keep adding data. So basically the idea is now if you want to go somewhere, you take it for granted that you can go on maps.google and it'll give you directions. I mean, the chemistry is going to become like that, where if you draw a compound, you should have a reasonable expectation as to what all of its properties are going to be, especially its useful properties. So the chemical um, libraries that we're currently working with are these dibenzylacetone derivatives. Again, they're relatively easy to make. It's just an alcohol condensation with acetone. And they have multiple applications for malaria, skin whitening, antibacterial, antioxidant, and so we're basically going to flush this out with this open matrix, and we're going to see if we can pop out some molecules that are worth making and testing. So currently, Matt has that diphenanthrene compound. It's sent to Oklahoma for testing, so we'll see what happens. But uh, that's the mechanics of it. And, uh, yeah, so my point is, hopefully I explain why it is that we're interested in openness in chemistry. And the other point is that it is important to think about the end user. And so... There are models, for example, where they would be really useful for an organic chemist, but they would have to team up with someone to interpret the code in the paper to be able to adapt it. So what we're doing, we're, we're giving all the information for the modelers. They can certainly replicate and investigate it, but we're not requiring the organic chemist to learn anything except type in benzoic acid and get the answer. So I think it is important to, to think about that. And... Uh, just thank Andrew Lang, our collaborator. You've seen his name on many of the um, slides here. Bill Acree, uh, he's actually a very eminent uh, researcher. He did all the Abraham model with uh, Abraham, and uh, he contributed a lot of data that was in his lab notebooks for the past 20 years. He pulled them out and put them into our database. And used them. So I'm very pleased. You know, that's a great uh contribution, Tony Williams from ChemSpider, and of course, Matthew McBride, you saw some of his experiments in reading a teeth over the summer. And uh, that's it. Thank you.